And I always tell people like, your business is not your baby. It's like, oh, but this is my baby. No, it's not. Because hopefully one day you sell your business and you never sell your babies. Gina Trapani. Hey, How are you doing today? Everything is just fine. That's, you, know, you don't want to say great right now. It's not a great kind of era, but it's just fine. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm excited about today's show, actually. Gina, this is a subject that is very near and dear to your heart that we're, we're going to talk about. What are we going to talk about? We have a fantastic guest today. She's the CEO of Black Girl Ventures, Shelly Bell. And I want Shelly to introduce herself, but I want I want to say it first. Excellent. Welcome, Shelly. Hi, thank you for having me. This is awesome. It's great to have you. Tell us a little bit about Black Girl Ventures. Yeah, so I'm Shelly Bell. I'm the founder of Black Girl Ventures. We work to create access to capital for Black and Brown women founders. And when I say create, we mean create where there may not be any. So access to capital for some founders means getting a new job or a better job. Access to capital for some founders means access to grants, access to loans, access to investment capital. So we really try to work to be sure, access to more customers. So we try to look at access to capital holistically. We believe that with access to capital, financial capital, community, which means new networks, and capacity that founders are able to create long-term sustainable businesses. That's amazing. Tell us more. How? How do you do all that? Just a little mandate. Just just, Just just a little little, just, Just a little something, making the world a little bit better. Well, would it help to tell you the story? Of like, okay. Yeah, please. How did, how did this come about? All right, here we go. So I was engaged to a man who did not want me to start a business, actually. And so I didn't at first because I'm like, oh, maybe this is what this wife thing is about. You kind of compromise sometimes. So I went to <laughs> work and I hated it every day, but I thought I was faking it really well. And so my boss called me in and said, you know what? You're amazing, but this is not for you. I was doing some patent search work at the time. So I went home and I was devastated. So I called California Psychics, which was the only responsible thing to do at the time. (laughs) And I was like, oh, my God, what is happening to my life? And the woman, she told me, when you find a thing that you want to do, the money will come and you're not going to be with that guy. And so within about two months, my entire world flipped upside down. I moved all the furniture out of the living room and kicked that guy out and then decided I'm going to build a teepee, put it in my living room and rent it out. And everybody's like, nobody's going to sleep in your living room in a teepee. I'm like, yes, they will. You know, so I'm this gathering is all these this is Airbnb. materials. I, mean- <laughs> I get my I get my little drill. You know, I'm on it. I'm drilling holes. I actually hot glued the fabric to the sticks. OK, and I don't recommend that that's the way to do it. But at the time, it sounded really good to me because I didn't have any other options because keep in mind, I really didn't know how to build a TV. This was me following somebody's DIY, and it was like the only one I could find online. Mm-hmm. So I go, you know, I build it, you know, and and of course, Airbnb has a TP option, but nobody recognized that at the time. So it really took off. I mean, people, I had so many people who wanted to stay, and I, I stepped it back because I wanted to build something where women could, a couple things. One, if you're a single parent, Or you just don't have any extra rooms, you can't make money off Airbnb. If you're a woman and you travel and you're looking for safe places to stay, might be safe to stay with, you know, other mothers or. But what I learned from that experience, I let one woman come and stay. And what I learned is safe space. Like if you and I, if all three of us walk into a building that is structurally sound, technically it's a safe space. Safe space means safe people. And if the people in that space are not safe then that's what makes the space unsafe. And so we use that a lot as a buzzword all over the place. Safe space, safe space. And it's like, yeah, it's not just the fact that we're all together. It is the fact that there's there are people with empathy, patience, grace, um, understanding that are together. As I'm listening to you too, like right before we started recording, I was looking at your website and you know, there's an enormous amount going on and it's not that old of an organization. And I just sort of, I was saying to Gina, how did they get all this done? And now that I learned about how you built the TP in your living room, I, like as you're saying it, I just went like, oh, okay. Like, so the TP in a living room is an amazing metaphor. It like, really I'm going to build a, you know, and it's about making a place for people to come 
build their community, right? So, so okay, get us from there. You've built a TP in your living room. Take us forward. Take us forward. Okay, so I built a TP in my living room, but after we let that one person come and stay, I was like, uh, actually, I don't want people sleeping in my living room in a TP. So what <laughs> other skills do I have? So I started looking at what other skills I had, and I learned to do uh, T-shirts, to make T-shirts at a previous job. So I landed on this idea called Made by a Black Woman, put it on a t-shirt. Everybody loved it. My mom invested her retirement, some of her retirement money. I used my tax, my tax return to buy my own machine. So I was printing my stuff and for other people through printing for like small festivals and influencers, landed some connections to like Google and Amazon, expanded into doing custom merchandise and started doing bigger orders. So now I leveled up all of these things over the course of like two years. And so at the end of that second year, we made Essence Magazine holiday gift guide for our infant body suits with that the Made by a Black Woman symbol on it. And so I learned so much throughout this time about building business. Now, I've lived many lives. Like I had, I, I was a vacuum, I saw vacuum cleaners in college. Where at one point I called myself a private eye, but it's a whole nother story. You know, I, I was a teacher, I was a K-12 teacher for like seven years. I did performance poetry, had my own art organization. So a lot of these things, I feel like when I landed on Black Girl Ventures, it really is like all the things that I've done from workforce development to working with kids from elementary school all the way to high school, teaching computer science. Like it was all the things that I had done. When the news came out that Black women are not receiving assets to capital, I said, okay, well, let's just do something about it. Like, I really get, I'm annoyed by all of the, like, complaints about what's happening and no innovative ways to fix it. And I say all the time, we can send cars to the moon, but we can't fix equality for some reason. So the first one was just a brunch. 30 women in a house. We got together. I cooked all the food, which I, I vowed to never do again. <laughs> and we, we voted with marbles and coffee mugs. It was like, you like this person's pitch? Put your marble in her coffee mug. I ran the whole thing like a poetry slam. I'm a poet. <laughs> I'm an artist. Like, And so wasn't thinking about it being really anything bigger. It was like, oh, people like this? Okay, well, let's just get together. Keep doing it. I kept doing it. Went out, got other partnerships to create space. Like, did a, had a volunteer team. And we went from, you know, 20 people, 40 people, 80 people. Landed a partnership with Google to 200 plus people across like seven or eight cities. And we started traveling and popping these things up at Google offices. People would come. We made it so you can vote with your dollars, became a Google charity. And then at the end of, end of 2019, because mind you, we're this is only like, all of this is happening. So to 2015, I started the print shop. 2016, I am moving into the full blown version of the print shop, traveling and vending. And then 2017, I'm moving into Black Girl Ventures fully. 2018, I said, listen, I'm going to give Black Girl Ventures 30 days. If it does not pop off, I am dropping it. <laughs> I'm going to put my print shop to the side and I'm going to give it 30 days. And if it doesn't do something that says I should keep it, I'm going to drop it. And so I gave it like all of my energy and it did and it worked. So here we are. We funded about 120 women to date. Uh, we still got the numbers coming in for this year, but over 100 women. We've had about 200 women come through the pitch competition itself. But then we also have five chapters where we have three to five women on the ground who actually work on behalf of Black Girl Ventures, furthering the efforts that, I, that I've created. So we package the pitch competition efforts and give it to them so that they can do it on their own. Okay, so kind of like an each one fun one kind of thing. And we have a virtual community. You know, we've just been hammering away at like what it means to like work through relationships and build people up and create like sustainability for communities. How did you know at the end of 30 days? What was the thing that made you say, all right, I'm going to double down on this? Money. It was bring So so we have a revenue generating model behind that, that, that's a, so, is That a is the right answer, answer right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If it did not show viability, it was going to have to be a nice passion. But they, we have a revenue generating model behind it. And so it's like crowdfunding meets Shark Tank, right? So it's like Kickstarter and Shark Tank put together. We have our own proprietary software women pitch, and then they donate through the platform. And then, but we influence with them. So crowdfunding has a huge opportunity cost. If you don't have a network, you got to like do all the videos, you got to do all the things. So we do the video because they pitch live with us and we record it. We put it up and then people can go and vote. They also like send out, you know, encourage people to vote and then we encourage people to vote. 
as I'm listening, what I'm hearing, when you say access to capital, it's it goes really, really deep. And I don't think people think about this a lot of times with Kickstarter and places like that. But the really good, really successful Kickstarters have thousands of dollars of investment in just how they communicate outwards. And if you're a new investor, you don't have access to that. So is that one of the things that you're doing? You're getting people kind of you know, into this world. So you help them with the video, like what else happens? And I guess maybe talk a little bit about the platform you've built, which is SheRays, right? Yes. So the the full operations look like we have an application process. We have reviewers that are business, you know, from the business community. We select about eight to 10 people and then we have pitch practice. So we actually coach them. So they have, mm. they have we do two pitch practices with them. After that, we do, right now, because of COVID, we do like a recording where everybody's there, the judges, and then we run through the whole thing as if it's live. We have our alumni actually available to watch or people in our BGV Connect community our incubator to, that can watch to learn from. And then we have a production team that puts it all together, makes it look amazing. And then we put it out into like a live event where people can go and, and um, use it. So with she raised, I could find platforms that will let people vote. And I could find platforms that would let people donate. And I could find platforms that would let people like vote and then donate later. But I couldn't find anything that would let people attach their vote to a donation and create levels of transparency that I wanted to create. So on the back end of She Raised, our founders could see everything. They could see how many votes they're getting. They can see their comments. They can see the fees that we take. They can see the capital that's coming out to them. We try to create as much transparency as, as possible because in a black community and underrepresented communities in general, trust is really important. And we take it seriously. And like that is our currency and black revenges is our brand trust. From a voter standpoint, you can go to the website, you can click through, you can look at the videos that are there, learn about founders that have already pitched. And then if there's an active event, you can actually go in and you can check out. So another thing I couldn't find was platform that will let people vote and donate and like vote for more than one person at a time. So you can vote in a checkout function. So you go and you can put in as many dollars for as many people as you want. Hit checkout. You can comment on as many of them, like the people that you donated to. And then it sends you a donation receipt on the back end for what you donate. And these donations are 501c3, you know, nonprofit donations. So that's also a benefit for our ability to influence people to give. Where do you find people are finding out about the events? And like, where are your, where are the people who are voting and donating coming from? Yeah, so... I have a way that I enter cities. And so I would say like the originally the way we would go into cities was to do a lot of relationship building. And so then we would create our own version of our own word of mouth. I think at this point, word of mouth, uh, we are word of mouth 10X, meaning like we have like different brands and influence and people and that we've worked with that we, you know, that just work with us. Like they picked us up. So I have like a huge amount of gratitude for being found in that way and people just sending it out, sharing it and really being willing to get involved. So I honestly have to say like word of mouth. I mean, we're we're big on Instagram. Instagram was one of the places that we started and we doubled down on Instagram as a major platform for us. But also it's just, it is the mushy stuff that's just like, I like them. You know, it's really that kind of stuff. And we work through people. We work through people with everything we do. And we try to, as much as possible, create automation around working with people as authentically as possible. You know, it'd be good to get a couple examples of funded pitches so that listeners understand kind of what the sort of things that are getting built. Totally. So we have a woman in our one of our alumni, Kai XR, is her platform, and she takes children through field trip experiences using VR. The story is I, when I met her about two years ago, she hadn't pitched at all. And so I pitch coached her for a event that I did as a part of a partnership with the k Center out in the Bay. And she won. And so then I invited her to come pitch at the Black Girl Ventures South by Southwest competition. She pitched there. She won again. And when she pitched, like literally everybody clapped for like a minute straight. And we oh. knew then like, <laughs> OK, this is the winner. Um, her story is just so amazing considering like what it means to have not had field trip experiences growing up from not being able to afford them or just like th- them being taken out of school all, all together. And her, her background is huge. She's been a journalist. She's done a lot of things and decided to double down on this as a business. We also have a, a husband and wife duo. They have a company called Spendit. 
where you while you're regularly shopping, you can actually pay your utility bills at the same time. So you can decide to uh, that a certain amount of like a dollar, extra two, three dollars on top of your spending goes to your utility bills every time you shop. And you could choose other debts too. But one of the things I found particularly interesting is that the utility bills as like an ongoing bill, you will always have to pay. And considering that even in a pandemic, people have not stopped spending. So, you know, how could we help people do a little bit of both? So I love what they're working on in their story. And then the wife also became one of our change agents, which is one of the chapter leads out in Houston. People should check out the KayXR website, which is has the best use of really bright color of any startup website I've seen in a while. Everybody's really into these sort of drab websites now. This thing is great. Three-minute pitch. What's got to be in a three-minute pitch? You know, it's so straightforward. Like, who are you? Why are you? Why do we care? And then what's the model? Like people want, you know, the investors, even the the donors, they want to know what's the model behind this? Is it sustainable? Is it going to work long term? A recent pitch conversation that we just had, which was uh, we partnered with a group called Rare Beauty Brands, who then brought in Ulta Beauty, which allowed us to be able to have the winner um, have an opportunity to actually sell from UltaBeauty.com. With that three minutes, uh, a place like Ulta wants to know, can you handle the volume? Do you have the traction? You know, do you have the manufacturing that can handle selling from a place like UltaBeauty.com? They're also particularly interested in, you know, working with more underrepresented founders. So, you know, those questions may look a certain way. And then investors in general, they also want to know, do you have the traction? Do you have the model? So what is it that you're doing? What problem is it solving? Or what inefficiency? What is it making more efficient? Sometimes we get too caught up on a problem and a solve, but it's, but how, how is this thing making something more efficient? And then, you know, it really depends. People love a good story. If you can tell a good story to draw in, you know, a listener, then the story should thread through though. So the story should also say like, why you for this? Right, why are you the right founder to tackle right. this problem? Shelly, how, how do you tell people that they need to cut the most important thing in their life. Like there's always that thing they really want to tell and then it's got to go. How do you give that feedback? Because I always find with founders and entrepreneurs, like, you got to give, it's hard for them to hear. Yeah, Paul, that's a pretty, that's a really great question because I'm a hardcore coach. I, I'm pretty straightforward about it. I'm like, listen, it's because like the investors are not the most like empathetic, kind people when they're like, well, what is this? Why are you doing it? Like, you know, like, and, mm-hmm. and don't get me wrong. Not, I'm not saying that everybody's that way, but- they really want to know how does it make money? And we and I found over the course of many, you know, like re- evaluating applications or talking to different people who are pitching or listening to pitches of feedback. At this point, hundreds literally from either background ventures or others that, well, one, people have a tendency to not want to talk about the money. But then uh, women have a tendency to ask for less or step back the money parts of the conversation. And it's like, how does it make money? Because I'm here to make money with you. So it's me trying to get people to see, or what I try to get people to see is the opportunity in them giving certain information. It's like, you're not giving me anywhere to get in on this journey with you. I want to give you money and I want to get in on the journey with you. Even if that is just my, I want to feel good in my spirit. That's part of me getting in on the journey. Or if it is, I definitely want to get my money back. So I want to get a return on me investing in you. So understanding there's a language barrier between capital raising and entrepreneurs, even in philanthropy. There's a language barrier there where people just are not speaking the same language. And that's why they're not referring to able to get like capital. What is the piece of advice? You said you're a hardcore coach and I don't doubt it. What is the thing that you find yourself telling founders when you're coaching them about their pitches kind of over and over, like the the most common mistake? Yeah, I would say, how does it make money? And why would I care about this? Like I get that you care about it, but why would I care? enough to give you my money. You're not showing me where to give you the money. So if you're not explaining your financial model, if you're not talking about your traction, if you're not giving me indications of longevity and sustainability, I got to know that if I give you this capital, you know, if if I, as an investor, we're giving you, to, we're investing that five years from now, you're going to still be around. You got to be able to communicate that. And that takes more than just heart and passion. I mean, granted, heart and passion and grit, you know, are are at the core of that. But at the same time, Show me how you understand your own business. One of the things also I think that I'm always saying is that like people want to hear your understanding of your business. We don't expect for you to have it all together right now, else you don't need us. 
Right. But know that, communicate in a way that if you don't have the answer, then communicate what could possibly be the answer later, you know, or say things like, thank you. I didn't think of that, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep that for next time. Or I'll look into that now, or, you know what, that's a great point. I'll, I'll actually pull that into what I'm doing. Like, that's what people want to hear, that you're coachable, that you're working through, and that you understand creating a business, not just a pitch. One of the hardest things about coaching, right, is, and I've been on the side, other side of this where I remember, I used to be a writer, but I had this brutal editor, and she just said to me at one point, she was like, that is a really important story to you, and it's incredibly boring to me. And once, like six months later, when I was able to feel something again, <laughs> I remember going, like, how important it is and how important a signal it is to, to pick up on boredom. Like people, those entrepreneurs want to be interested. And actually you're lucky if you get one of the ones who's like, what the hell is this? The worst, now we're back on the other side of the table. This is me because I don't like to confront a lot of the time. And I'll be the one going like, oh, that's very interesting. Thank you for your time, which is a disaster, right? Like they're not, no one's getting any value out of that. I'm, we're just kind of confused. So I'm getting people to kind of, be interesting. And it's the hardest feedback to give because you got to say like, you're not interesting right now. You need to do something that other people care about. And they're sitting there with their whole life in their hands going, people don't care about this. It's, it's just hurtful. So really what you're saying is, is to be a good coach and get people into that, the three minute pitch, you just have to be very hurtful. I don't think that's what Shelly was saying, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> not necessarily, you know, I wasn't necessarily saying that, but constructive Criticism is hard to take sometimes. Fair. Yeah. Very yeah. fair. Okay. Shelly, do you do you think your founders see BGV as a stepping stone toward pitching like venture capital firms? How is that played out? Or what are those conversations like? Yeah, 100%. The feedback that we get is they're more confident in going and pitching in front of someone else. And I think this is why it's important for me to keep it real and be really not hard, but like straight up. Because what happens that, and again, there's a language barrier, a language difference between culturally, between these investors and them, um, investors in anybody, by the way, but investors and yeah. in, in them because the investor is not there to always like understand you. And then they won't give you the feedback that said the straight up feedback. They'll just be like, okay, thank you. And then you'll be like, what happened? Why didn't it work? I wonder what they, why did it? And so I think like in order for you to, you know, we have, we've had women say like, I've sat in 13 week courses and I've never gotten as much feedback or felt as confident as I have through sitting through this one hour pitch coaching. So I think, yes, they get, they're, they're more apt to go out and pitch when they feel like they've had some really straight up feedback about what they're doing and some understanding. Cause really a lot of what I do is like reframing. It's like, okay, yes to this. And have you ever thought about consider move these colors around? This is too much work, too many words. You know, here's what people are looking for. If you've never been in touch with, you know, certain people, then how do you know what they're looking for? Let me say something and then you tell me how wrong I am, which is that what I'm hearing is access to capital. The biggest gap is communication skills. It's it's everything else is there to make a viable business, but and not even communication skills, but the ability to communicate to a specific type of investor. That seems to be the big gap that you're spending a lot of your time closing up. Is that a fair statement or are there things I'm missing? What's... I would add to that, like, it's not just on the founder side. The investor challenges are there. Like the investors not being able to, you know, really communicate well or understand or even feel like they have to understand the founders mm -hmm. that they're about to invest in. That is a problem. So I would say that, like, yes, it is all about communicating. That's what you're doing when you're pitching. You're communicating. That's what your pitch deck is doing. It's communicating. And this is what they're doing when they give you feedback. They're communicating. So I never, I don't know that I've singularly put it into one word that way, but it absolutely is all about improving communication, which is the key to equity and inclusion, right? Is that if we could kind of tweak how we communicate or understand the communication of others, then we could send that card to the moon that that's also equitably <laughs> right. equitable and, and inclusive. <laughs> I know the exact card of the moon you're talking about too. It's a lot. It's a lot. We've been talking about what your founders need to do in order to get their pitch tuned up. Help the investors listen better. What do they need to do? 
Get some black friends. The fr- <laughs> I mean, we could really stop Let's the just, podcast there, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean. Yeah, but you know, honestly, when you're talking about investors and you give them that advice, that's that's a dangerous game as well. It right? really like is a dangerous game. They're, they're, they're going to they're gonna call someone. Right, say, right. And that, some or or they're going to go, hey, Shelly, I have black friends. Right? Like, <laughs> And then that's a whole other story. So what I, what I am meaning by that is – to investors could, one, start to understand other cultures. We do it when we travel outside the country. You know, we we do it when we go to little known places in the world. We're so intrigued by other people's cultures, but we have, you know, people right here that we don't understand. And so I would say, like, if you could take a step back and explore culture, the same way you explore culture when you go to other countries, you don't go there taxing all of the people in the country to, to teach you how to be. You read up first. You understand first, you try to find out as much as you can, and then you go and you attempt to acclimate and not interrupt or disrupt. So I think like that kind of uh, way of thinking, since we already have it in us um, when we travel, why not try and move that into this realm? I think another thing is really honoring Black history. And I say, and I don't mean Black History Month or like some particular incidents regarding Martin Luther King. Like I, What I mean by that is understand that the black community has only had about 60 years uninterrupted to grow wealth. And, you know, if we count the subprime mortgage crisis level things, then really we talking 10, 15 years, right? If that. Having an understanding of that, there's no way that that founder can fare up against a hundred plus year system of growing wealth, right? Like So in that case, you just got to put different eyes on it. You got to put different ears on it. You got to listen to it different because these founders are coming up with things that will absolutely shape the future of work, shape the future of education, shape the future of the financial industry. And, you know, to be so removed from what it means to innovate as an investor and not be able to see all because of what risk, you know, I think it's so interesting. Like we keep treating investment like it's blackjack, but it's really roulette. We keep acting like it's so predictable as if we can absolutely determine that the white guy with the backpack is going to be the right founder because he knows how to just live with a toothbrush and boxers. Like, what? We also forget that he fails 99% of the time. But and yet he presents as if he hasn't at all. I mean, I, I think about just the confidence gap. Like, you know, I've seen I've seen not to make broad gender gender based generalizations, but I'm going to do that. Do it, Gina, you know, do it. Men it's, who know very little and present as if they are the absolute experts. And you have women who are, you know, proven and just are absolute experts and who will say, you know, I'm on my path. I'm learning. And, and just that different slight different presentation right no i know and the dude because i mean this has been the dude has read like five web pages and the woman has a math exactly. degree, right? and, and I mean, you know I've that, seen it. that's what the studies show you know yeah. when you look at a job description they want to meet like 95 percent of it and a man uh, a man will look at it and say oh i got two of these i'm going for it <laughs> the research shows you know that women also make you more money when you invest in them they also save money better they also outpace men, I think, around 6% uh, when it comes to crowdfunding, successful crowdfunding. And I've been saying lately, like, investors can't tell us that they're looking at the numbers because all the numbers say invest in women. All the numbers say invest in diverse teams. And if you are looking at diversity as just skin color, then that's also a challenge we got to talk about, right? Like, there's cognitive diversity. There's neurodiversity. Like, there's just so many ways to be diverse. It's differently able. There's that we just are, have totally disregarded when it comes to what it means to be diverse. It's an interesting journey. I'm optimistic because I'm a serial optimist that the positivity is there and people will pick it up and, and run with it. What I love about this story is it says, it goes from, you know, I called the I called the hotline, I built a TP, <laughs> and now I have a what five city platform with total transparency about funding. You seem to have a couple hundred founders in your directory. So that is just a flat out accomplishment. It's really fascinating to see. And, uh, you know, as you poke through, I looked at a couple of profiles and it's just like, these are really interesting human beings who are doing a tremendous amount of stuff. So people should go check this out. Um, Black Girl Ventures. Yeah, someone wanted to donate or support or attend the next event. They should go to the website. Blackgirlventures.org. If you're a founder and um, any founder of any color. <laughs> we also put out a lot of resource alert alerts, a lot of job alerts. So definitely follow us 
on Instagram at Black Girl Ventures. Any other cities, any other chapters that are growing? What, what's your next city? Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, so right now we have efforts in general across 12 cities. We have the largest presence on the East Coast for entrepreneur support organization for Black and Brown women. We are about to launch a chapter in New York. Uh, we'll be working with, actually working with Johnny, Johnny Walker Brands um, on mm-hmm. that. And we Great. have a, a, a brand called Omaze which will be, we'll be launching chapters in LA and Houston. There's a couple of things I can't quite talk about yet with some really big partners. But yeah, we definitely have a goal to stretch out across the country and then to look at going international. So look, uh, Shelly, if anybody wants to get in touch with you specifically, what's the best way to follow you, reach out? What should they do? Yeah, I am Shelly Bell everywhere. I am S-H-E-L-L-Y, B is in boy, E-L-L. So whether you are, you know, Instagram, Twitter, my website, I am ShellyBell.com. You can reach out to me on any of those. Good. Well, thank you so much for coming yeah, on. Thank you for too. having me. All right, Gina. I'm going to go build a teepee. That was I amazing. Know, that was amazing. One of the best origin stories ever. I was like, did she say teepee? She did. <laughs> Most origin stories don't have a beginning that awesome and then a really happy ending. That was very cool. <laughs> All right, so good. So people should really, they should check out blackgirlventures.org. That's a lot of platform to build in now a long time and and, uh, some unique intellectual property. And the founder directory is just really interesting. There's just a lot going on in terms of investors who should be listening. Reading there is, I think, a good place to start, at least for me. The investment community always talks about disruptive products, but when most investors need to be disrupted. So I love the work that's going on here. You don't say. You couldn't tell from my broad <laughs> smile this entire conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I like Gina, I, I like when Gina keeps me honest. Um, all right, so hello at postlight.com if you need us. We're, we build uh, wonderful things online. We're a good strategy partner. And as we noted in here, um, we do like to, to stay connected to the community. And we do like to support people with great organizations like this. Gina, are you going to get back to work? I'm going to get back to work. Lots to do. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, Paul. Bye. Bye.